say to you. I didn't get a letter. Hi, welcome everyone to our first seminar of 2014. We're very happy that you're all here for this DG Conservatory seminar. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Terry Stratton. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild, and I plan the seminar series, uh, one of which is tonight. If you have any special requests for seminars that you'd like to see, people you'd like to hear from, things you'd like to learn about, please feel free to let me know. I can be reached at tstratton at dramatistguild.com or take a look at the Dramatist Guild website and you can find my email address and everyone else at the Guild. I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to please silence your phones. I'm not going to ask you to turn them off because you might want to tweet a question while we're here, who knows. Uh, but if you could check in on Twitter or Facebook, let everyone know you're here. Let all your friends know that they can ask questions during the event. That would be fantastic. Uh, hello to our online audience. If you have questions, hashtag new play. Don't forget. And I'd like to personally thank the lovely Georgia Stitt, who is taking time out of her busy schedule tomorrow. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so without further ado, I will hand it over to our Behind the Musical guys and Georgia Stitt, and we'll get started. Thanks so much. Yay. <laughs> I'm clapping for myself. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Hi, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited at the turnout. It's a great group. Yeah, come on up. Coming up, we're coming up. We're this is Michael and Kyle. Hi. This is Michael Walker and Kyle Ewalt. And they are a writing team. And uh, they're our first, our first group. I want to start by, t by setting up what the theme of today is. We, we have three teams that are, are all working on musicals. They have musicals in development. And all of them, what links them tonight is that they all cover territory that we would say is uh, is a little bit off the mainstream. They're not they're about communities that you probably have not encountered in your daily experience. And so they have had to research and understand and get into the brains and the experiences of these people who whose lives are very different from ours. And so what we're going to talk about today is their processes, processes about how they do that, how they un, how they uncover these worlds and have gain access to them and share them with us. So this is our first team. Awesome. Hi, you guys. <laughs> so tell us, just give, give me just a little bit, give everybody a little bit of introduction. Who are you? Who's the writer? Who's the composer? How does it work? And then we'll jump right into a song and do a little bit more after we have a musical language for you. Sure. Uh, so I'm Michael. I write the book, and we share lyric credit. Kyle is the composer. Um, and, and we curate this, this show, Behind the Musical, so thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> And we worked on a, a bunch of different shows. Uh, we'll tell you more about what we're sharing tonight. Uh, the show that people mostly know from uh, from us is called Bromance, the Dude's Goal. It's a very serious piece. Of <laughs> so, Hard hitting. Um, which is not a hidden world, maybe. That's probably the opposite of what we're doing tonight. In your case, well. <laughs> what are some of the other topics that you guys have covered in this series, just before we get too deep into tonight's topic? Uh, so this is our second one with the Dramatist Guild and live stream. Um, and uh, the, the one before this was about, uh, it was called YouTube, musical theater uh, and YouTube, and how sort of social media and live stream things are influencing writers and, uh, or people writing specifically for things that can be shared online, mm -hmm. or how, yeah. how are people using social networking. Even how composers and lyricists are being forced to have a social media presence and what that does to inform the writing process. Cool, um, I'm going to go back and watch that one. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, either we just we've done like shows about the influence of rock music on contemporary musicals, uh, mythology. We did a mythology show, which was cool. Did Very a cool. whole uh, evening of trunk songs and what <laughs> happens to those trunk songs after they go into the trunk. It must be great because you guys get to learn so much from other people as well oh, as gosh. having your own sharing experience. Oh, it's it's wonderful. For, I mean, the number one thing we get out of this is community, which is yeah for us. So what we're all looking for. I know. I know. <laughs> but it's, it is rare to get to share the stage with other writers, you know, who are developing shows. I mean, it's such a nice thing mm -hmm. to be doing a show together as opposed to sort of, is it my show, is it yours? You know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. something wonderful about that. So. And the writer's experience so often is, I'm alone in my computer or my <laughs> piano, I'm doing this, and I'm sitting here trying to stay focused and solve the problem, and to you have your collaborator, but to be able to open it up to other like-minded people who are dealing with the same problems is great. Absolutely. All right, so back on task. Um, set up the first song that you're going to do and a little bit about your show. Just give us a kickoff into what we're going to do, and then we'll come back and talk about a little more. Uh, so we're going to share songs tonight from our newest show called The Lucky Ones, 
uh, which is all about lottery winners. Uh, and <laughs> we can get How many people here have won the lottery? <laughs> <laughs> right, so it's a hidden world. It's a, okay. it's a hidden world. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 a, it's a funny world in that it's obviously everyone knows the lottery and everyone knows of winning what winning the lottery theoretically means, but the specifics of of what it does to your life is sort of a little less known, and we did a lot of research into real people and their stories, and that's sort of what we can talk about. But the first song uh, we're going to do is, we're going to have Rob Maynor come up here, and um, the lovely Ben Raha is going to play for us. Um, and I don't even want to tell you the name of the song, because I feel like it will spoil things, but uh, you should know that he is a Wiccan priest who has won the lottery. There you go. Like you do. <laughs> but like actually there yes. Like someone did. Someone did. <laughs> <laughs> there was a wicked breeze actually. Wicked. 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 Yes. <laughs> The owners, Bill and Jeannie, are the sweetest folks I know. So when I won, I got the flock to help the chateau grow from one to seven stores nationwide. Well, Bill and Jeannie, they were thrilled by my expansion plan. I said, I'm paying back the gods, I'm just a simple man. But gee, for me, well, not a thing would be more awesome than to teach a class about Wiccan pride. Well, of course, they said you could give a lecture next week. Use the reading room inside our shop, it's spacious and sleek. And they invited all their friends to attend. There were pagans galore. And since this was my chance to show them what I'm about, I filled the room with incense and put candles out. But I should have known that tapestry would catch on fire and burn down half of the store. I tried to do one good thing, only to make a mess of it all. I turned to my wicked gods, who tell me that charity is my call. And though I try to carry the torch, Seems like everything I touch I scorch So blisteringly lousy And taking it forward heard the news, I'd won the lottery. He begged me for some cash to build himself a Model T. He's got a thing for cars and always had the dream that he could get a vintage piece of his own. And when Aunt Mary saw the car and heard the thing I did, she asked for help to fund a trip to London and Madrid. And Sue and Morty asked to pay off both their mortgages. I didn't have the money to loan. They all laughed and said, you're lucky that you're rolling in dope. Don't be selfish, help us out, like the gods told you so. And so I uh, gave to my credit cards, maxed out and poor Aunt Mary. She got stranded at an airport in Spain. So you ask me, why aren't I shocked by the news when you tell me, Ducky, the little that's left will take seconds to lose. It's my burden. No, no, it's much worse. It must be a curse because I am certain my win only made my propensities worse. My gods, set aside, what should I do? My gods, how can I stop disappointing you? Should I stay on my path and watch havoc ensue? Or accept the damn deal and admit that I'm through? I tried to do one good thing, only to make a mess of it all. I turned to my wicked gods, Tell me that charity is my call And though I try to follow your rule I'm sure I'll sink like a titanic fool The fact is I'm lousy I'm taking it forward America, watch me fail Congratulations. So um, where, how, where are you in the stages of development? Do you have a complete first draft? Do you have a first act? Where are so, you? So uh, this was actually, awesomely, a commission for Broadway Across America. And so we, just about a week ago, uh, presented it to them in its completed, I guess it's really a first draft. I mean, a, 
far along first draft with uh, wonderful people, including Rob and Sandy, who you'll see. Um, so yeah, so it's sort of in a it, it's state of completion, but you know. But waiting, nothing's but, ever done. Oh, no, right, no, 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 no nothing, oh no, right. Like waiting nothing's for ever done. the next step, which will probably be, you know, word from them and then a million rewrites. Right, notes <laughs> so, from them and, and questions yes. and adjustments and that sort of thing, right. Yeah. And how are you feeling about it at this point? I, I'm, I'm, I'm a soft. Okay, I'm like, I'll just throw that to him. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. I, um, I think what's been really fun to see is how people go in and, and they, they know it'll be fun and, and goofy because it's just kind of that type of thing. We're talking about lots and lots of money and, and changing lives. But um, kind of as with Ducky as a character, like, Giggles, Wiccan Priest, it's gonna be, he's going to be funny. But also, he's got this plight and he has some serious things he needs to work through. So it's really great to humanize, see the, the, the human sides of so many different types of people from different walks of life. So they're not just archetypes, they're actual characters. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, that's yeah. the goal, well, that's right? The goal. Yeah, that's yeah. everyone's goal. Um, okay, so how much, so we all have a, a context for like seeing a TV commercial of someone who won Publishers Clearinghouse, I won the lottery, or right. some, or, or. making the story that we follow instead of just snapshots of people who were instantly rich. Yeah, I mean, I think early on it was was the, we had the debate of like, do we want this to just be vignettes or do mm -hmm. we want this to be, you know, a narrative? And and for us, we really wanted it to be a, a through narrative. So we had to find the the spine that links them together, right? I mean, in, in real life, all these lottery winners didn't interact on a daily basis, right? There's not like... A convention. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I want to go to that convention. I mean, there probably should be. <laughs> Though we kind uh, of made one. Well, so, so what we, in our research, I mean, we're researching all these people, then we started watching, like, some little documentaries we could find and uh, TV specials, and we sort of saw a couple of news specials and realized, oh, what are these news specials, but where, you know, a, an event where they bring together, like, seven or eight different lottery winners. Uh, sometimes they're, like, the cautionary tales, sometimes they're the, let, these guys are doing awesome. So we sort of set up the convention that they're all being invited, all the people we meet are being invited to this news uh, special, special, sorry, TV special. And so like act two, everyone arrives at the special and starts to interact. So the first act is challengingly sort of um, disparate stories that then start to inter intertwine. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually used, uh, love actually as our model for mm. like how to structure it because we were surprised and if people have uh, knowledge of this throw it out there but we were surprised how few musicals we could find as guides for like we initially started I think with like 10 separate stories now we're down to like seven because we've cut some people but um like how few musicals are structured in a way that is this sort of love actually like interwoven mm -hmm. separate stories with mm -hmm. I have a musical um that similarly is about a lot of different characters, and at every developmental stage, someone has said to me, "But who's the main character?" Oh yes. Yeah. But who are we supposed to? Who's who? Yeah. Where do we hang our hat? Who's yeah, the yeah. main character? And I remember being extremely frustrated by that, yeah. and then ultimately trying to pick one and trying to focus it towards one, and 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 learning about how that changes the nature of the way you're telling the story. Mm -hmm. If you're saying one person's story is more important than everyone else's, yeah. So are you finding that to be a similar? A similar? We did get that. We did get, <laughs> right? immediately got that, um, and. Are struggling with it in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we 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 added a frame mm -hmm. with one character sort of commenting on the journey, and we thought that that would help teach the audience how to watch the show. Because mm -hmm. I feel like that's the challenge, right? If it's not a traditional narrative, and it's not like I walk in and I know who my love interest is, and I know who my you know comic relief is, I feel like the audience sort of almost needs to learn. That's what we felt like need to learn. How am I supposed to watch the show? Mm -hmm. Who am I supposed to? Which is, I think, what you're saying. And so we we added a frame in which one of the characters, who Kyle's going to sing his song later, um, sort of sets up his journey, and I think makes him basically the main character. And then we tried to also have a scene in which he interacts with every single person in Act Two, in individually, in a way that sort of changes his trajectory, mm -hmm. so that his journey is sort of the the one that's. Yeah, you could argue, good, I mean, you know, everyone will have an opinion about yeah. this. You could argue that the person who is the most changed is the one that right. we pay the most attention right. to, or the, that right. we relate the most to, the one that's going on the biggest journey. Yeah. But ideally, you want everyone to go on a big journey, right? right? Yeah. 
Yeah, challenging. It is. It is very challenging. Um, another thing to think about, I'm going to be the horrible person who talks about money, but another thing to think about is, like, if you're casting this, is it a commercial? If you're doing it for Broadway Across America, it's going to be commercial. So are you going to have a big star in one part and smaller people in the other parts? Right. Or are you going to try to have 15 stars? Or yeah. And so when you think about, like, if, all right, if I have one star contract, who gets so that one? Who does it go to? I mean, another thing, I'm talking too much, but but is that one of the other things that really excited us about the lottery is that the who wins is completely arbitrary, right? There's no, there are no qualifications, there's no rules, anything. So the, the people in the cast are incredibly diverse, both age, age range, geographically, uh, you know, background, which for us was really exciting. And it doesn't totally answer your question, but I think that there's something nice about the fact that, like, if you're if you're talking about casting, like, there's only two, like, you know, there's a man and a woman who are sort of in their twenties, like leading leading men, leading woman types, and then there's like, you know, a woman in her fifties, a woman in her sixties, a man in his seventies, mm -hmm. you know, like, so that it, mm -hmm. I think, would make it easier to be like, well, if you have the celeb, it's like the and we'd like to think we wrote the some what? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the song. Well, because so I could see that you're celeb. saying it's the it's the woman of stature, it's the 50 year old woman who is like yeah. arrived, or you say it's the hot 30 year old man who's the hottest thing run Broadway <laughs> right mean, now, or it's the up and coming 20 it. year old kid. Right, it, you're uh, right. right there we go. Star. Right, right. <laughs> any star who says yes, you can. That's fine. <laughs> good, good. All right. So then, I, I have one more question, then we hear some more music. But my next question is, what have you, what challenges have you found, or what have you been doing to like? find the vocabulary of the show, the way that you're telling the story. Like what as we we're talking about Hidden Worlds and Access, what are you what are you doing to make this show sound, both in terms of the text and the music, sound different or sound unique to this world? Well so this is an answer and feel free to ask for more. I feel like because these are so many different types of people from different walks of life, we needed to treat each one of them with respect and individuality when we approached their character, the character arc, the, the um, orchestrations, composition, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are moments where they come together and those moments kind of tend to be Americana in their style. So I think that's what Michael and I have tried to do with the past couple shows we've worked on is embrace what musical theater has been and what has brought us to where we are and um, engage with where we want musical theater to go or where we think pop culture is. Mm -hmm. So there are flecks of all that within the score. Uh, and then when these, when everybody comes together, we feel like there's kind of a, a bit of a, a shimmer of America on top of it. Are all of your characters American? They well, are. It's all, it's all, well, I mean, they're not, some of them are immigrants, I guess, is what you were going to say. Yeah. They're a Haitian immigrant. But, but they're all. But American by immigration. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Living in America. Mm -hmm. Though we do acknowledge the fact that lotteries have been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Great Wall of China was built with lottery money. Really? Yeah. Yeah, the history, I mean, the history of lotteries, insane. Well, you'll have and to amazing. see the opening of Act 2 to learn more. About <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get my kids into school, so I know all about the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, a really good, it's a really good retirement plan. It's a really go, good right. education plan. Well, let's hear your next song. I have more questions, and I'm sure people here do too, but let's, get, let's do another one so we have a cool. little bit more context. Uh, so we're going to have Sandy Rosenberg sing Refrigerator, our, our Refrigerator. Um, and her character, Patricia, uh, has recently won the lottery, and her husband, Frank, is really excited about all of the fabulous things he wants to buy and she's he asks her what what do you want what do you really want and this is her response not to him but when he leaves the room Thank you. 
Tell me about her. Um, so all of our characters are inspired by, as opposed to. I mean, yeah. Yes. How could they be? You're right. Yeah. Um, but her that song um, came from. We were watching this uh, uh, TV show, and there was this interview with a woman who was a lunch lady who had won with like thirteen of her other lunch ladies, um, and lived in the I mean the middle of nowhere. So I, where it was Wisconsin or something. It was like somewhere very remote and don't and be she, offended if you're no, in Wisconsin. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but this was a remote part of a remote of, of the state as opposed to like the entire state. But um but she they interviewed her and they were sort of like, how has life changed? Like they kept their jobs, they all stayed working together. And she said, Well, the, I didn't even know to, I don't know what to do with money. Like I have no idea. The only thing I've ever dreamed of was having an ice maker on my fridge because I like to take a big mug, uh, a big gulp. The big gulp every day and if I could just have ice in it and it would stay cold that would be mean so much to me and so then they film her getting a refrigerator not even stainless steel like just an old refrigerator like I mean I guess it was a new refrigerator but like plain old refrigerator that had an ice maker and she was she started crying like she just started like hysterical crying she's like I never thought I could have anything so beautiful in my life and it was so amazing to watch because like I mean you think when you win the lottery like what you just assume everyone wants a Jaguar or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, and we just thought, that's so beautiful. Like, there's something so beautiful about it. Uh, we just sort of have to make that into a song. Um, and, you know, I think that's probably the only thing that, that Sandy's character sort of has in common with that, that character. It, her story is then with her husband from another couple that we sort of that were inspired by. But um, it just sort of struck us that, like, Talking about what perspective, simple, yeah. simple joys mm -hmm. are, and then where the the battle between a desire to go from zero to sixty in a second and a desire to keep things the same mm -hmm. um, post win. Mm -hmm. Great. You have a third song. We do. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. So we change of change of plans is, is that um, Kyle's going to sing this one because one Yay. of our singers uh, couldn't make it last minute. But also because Kyle's amazing. Also because Kyle, <laughs> you will see, can sing. Uh, we can set it up, um, I guess. So we were talking about our our lead character, if you will, who's mm -hmm. going to um, take us through this journey. His name is Nate. Um, Nate wins with a group of women um, who all work together at the Mayo Clinic, and it's Nate's job to deny people medical coverage. So every day he has the meetings with people to say, your treatment's experimental, or you, you don't have enough, or you're, you don't qualify because you make too much, whatever it is. He just ruins people's lives on a daily basis. Um, and also has a, a special place in his heart for superheroes, and feels like he, he's trapped and, and can't achieve this superhero potential. And this is the only song you'll see from before someone wins. So this is the day before, the day of the big draw, but he hasn't won yet. We're taking you back. But So how, alert, is this wins. early in the show? Is this? This one is, this is the second or third song in the show? Yeah. Okay. And so just before you start, Cal, yeah. so the, what is, what is the, just so we have context, yeah. what is the opening number? And this is the second song. So what do we already the, know? The opening number is um, the, the reporter who will eventually be the reporter of the new special um, at a bodega interviewing people in line waiting for to buy tickets. So it's the eve of, it's basically the eve of the largest lottery draw in history. Mm -hmm. um, we had to bump it up because draws are getting so insane that right. when we first started writing this a year ago, we made it 600 million and then there was like a 600 million dollar jackpot. So it's one. One billion twenty-five million. Wow. Which will happen in the next year. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Which is it'll be crazy. over a billion years within the next. But year. the reason that it'll happen is because they made the odds so much worse. 
no one knows this, or no one paid attention to this, but they made the, the odds for a Powerball ticket used to be 1 in 175 million. It's now 1 in 295 million as of like a month ago. Mm. And they it's so that the they can, But you could on be the, the one. But you could still be the one. I mean, I guess at that point, like, what's the difference, right? Right. Like, um, okay. Anyway, so we so we've seen them in line waiting in the bodega, and then we we zoom in on him, and we see him, right. and right. then at some point following, we find out who's one, and right? He's we, among them. We see, yeah, we see everybody, we see basically everyone in the cast win or lose at the same time, and then we sort of follow our winners from there. It's like on a reality show when you yes. see the auditions, and yes. you don't know who's going to win, and then you <laughs> follow them. Okay. And we're trying to, yeah, we're trying to do things in the first like twenty pages to like deflect, so you're not quite sure who to follow. A little, bit. I mean. Nate You're playing is, with that, Nate yeah. is the exception, where because he does the frame, so you know he's a winner. But, yeah, trying to play with the audience a little bit so that they're like, wait, who am I? Mm -hmm. Who's going to win? Okay, good. All right, let's hear cool. it. Can give you that again? Black and Decker brews up my caffeine Add two sugars and some coffee mate Eat raisin bran and dress by eight The morning show is glowing on the screen It's predictable and simple, my routine I play it safe out the driveway at 8.30, parked and in the hospital by 9. Get another coffee, tell the girls hello, put today's appointments in a row. Stick to my script, I'm set to go, cause this life is my comfortable existence. Where risk is in the distance. I have to give, but scared of change, I know it's how I've got to live. I play it safe. A pen each night on TV at 11. I sit on my couch and watch the fearless fight. Those DC comic heroes seem unreal, but they know exactly how I feel. How secretly I long of dreaming to take flight If I won the lotto, God, I'd make things right Cause when the flash was hit by lightning He used his speed to fight for good And when Clark Kent would take his suit off He'd soar like no other man could I'd make this jackpot Power. Give me strength to seize the day Would that be the chance for me To do it their way? Who am I kidding? No one ever really wins the lotto So I am off to bed meetings At 1.30 I'll deliver more bad news at 3.15 Get my final coffee Tell the girls goodbye. Drive home in time for Family Guy. And wait around to watch others fly. Yes, I'll play it safe. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Do you guys, um, first of all, I just want to give it a second. Yeah. If anybody in the room has a question for them. Yeah, okay. And also if we had anything on social so media. The priest is, he's supposed to be wicked before the lottery. He was wicked before the lottery and he's wicked after the lottery. Yeah. He stays wicked? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wait, he, are you saying wicked or Wiccan? What do they say? Well, can, like the, uh, believes in pagan gods. Mysticism and. How do you spell it? W-I. C-C-A-N. 
So that was a question I was saving that I, you know, but I wonder how much do you feel like you have to educate the audience about things like that? Oh, do you know, yeah, or about like, what is it to be a Wiccan priest? What is it? I mean, they're, you know, cause she thought you were saying wicked, I think, right? Yeah. And, yeah. um, he was wicked. He was Wiccan. And so Somebody is that. that as a musical. Yeah, yeah. Wiccan. Somebody's already done that. This one's already Someone taken. One. Um, I mean, that's a good question. Yeah. I is mean, that cultural? Uh, is, that a, a, is that a thing that's safe to assume that everybody knows? Or right. is it do you set it up at some point? Do you explain uh, it at we, some point? We, well, we explain it a bit. Maybe not enough. I mean, that it's a, it's a good well, question. Well, if she watches contested. the whole musical, that you might see if that was a question yeah, in the yeah, future. Yeah. But I mean, certainly the first time we meet him is in an interview with. The news reporter, and so she asks him questions, and uh, he sort of explains a little bit. And then, you know, someone hears that he won, and she's like, Can you touch my ticket? And he's like, Yes, and he starts talking to the gods. And then she's like, Are you talking to Jesus? And he's like, Not exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then rips and her then ticket. Somebody else says, He's a witch. Right. So, like, and oh, so know, it this is, guy's so a it witch. Is spelled out a bit. Yeah, it is yeah. spelled out in a way. That, um, mm -hmm. And then that song happens in act. Too, actually, once yeah. he's gone through a lot more, and then you get to It's hear not by any means a criticism. No, yet. no, no, It's no, just no, a no. question of yeah, whether yeah. it's a thing that you have to. Yeah, but it's deal a good with. thing because it's a good question because I think, especially once you're researching something, you start to assume that the knowledge that you have is that's right is that's out right. there, right? I've and, absolutely had things that a director will say, "Well, why, why this?" And we're like, "Well, because the character said that." And right. like, I, the character, and I was like, "Oh, well, in the last draft, they did. Right. <laughs> we, we cut it, but you should still know that it's there." That's right. <laughs> right. 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 And, and even like lottery, like we have like a press conference for lottery. And at first, I when I was writing the scene, I I really took like word for word, like many pieces that were you know. And then you start to cut away, partially for time and partially because it's sort of like the reality is a good influence, but it doesn't quite matter if it doesn't make sense to the audience, right? Like mm -hmm. it's sort of right. like right. I'm like no, no, but it's so true and right. It's sort of done, only yeah. it's all about communicating. We have right. to communicate, right? Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
go away. All it takes is a step. Forget what he just said. Just a small, simple step. Dance away the fear, it'll disappear, leaving a you both let's start Tim about creating the um, what I asked them before about creating the world of the sound of this score and how is it different from other things you've written um, well I, I think we we're faced with a pretty obvious struggle uh, right <laughs> off the top which is sort of sort of why I was reluctant to do to do a project like this um, were you you were reluctant I was reluctant yeah um, uh, I I realized uh, that I would be writing for a musical theater audience, so mm -hmm. I want to um, write music that feels um, like it opens up for such an audience and it's uh, uh, familiar to them in some ways. But I also wanted to, to make sure that I didn't ignore the fact that we were writing a musical that takes place in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I started using a term a lot right off uh, at the beginning, um, which is like racist music. <laughs> um, my fear was of writing racist music. I didn't want to write, you know, have like a little lick here or a little harmony there that made everybody go, oh, right, we're in Afghanistan now. Right. I remember that because you did that, you know. Right. I wanted it to feel flavored, you know, throughout, and but also um, to, to, you know, have uh, Western musical theater things uh, as well, because that's what I love. That's mm -hmm. why I write musicals. And, do you have um, models in like pieces that you looked to that have done that successfully? You know what's funny is actually I started out being really judgmental of all other musicals that did this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I developed models along the way. I have never loved the King and I as much as I do now. Mm. I, I think I, I thought what he was doing was so, um, like he didn't try or something. Like he was, uh, um, uh, he like, being Richard Rogers. Yes, Ron. Yeah, Richard Rogers. This is his <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, lazy. Yeah, lazy. <laughs> um, yeah, Richard Rogers. Uh, uh, and and. But I always liked the show, but being faced with the problem, I was like, I'm going to try really hard to come up with a really good solution to this problem, mm -hmm. the very best that I can. And as I went along, I started realizing the, the real trick is to make the, um, or what I think the trick is, is to find your own, your own language, like your own language that doesn't sound like either thing, really. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and therefore, you don't have to be so afraid of writing racist music because you're actually writing your music. Mm -hmm. and, um, like that tune, da 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 da. Like I think about it all the time because it doesn't sound like anything to me. It, uh, in particular, it doesn't sound like he lifted that. That's something that. wonderful, something right? Something wonderful, exactly. Ching, ching. You're nailing it. <laughs> There's more on the way for you. Just wait. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, and maybe that's one of my my favorite ones to point to at this mm -hmm. point it, because it's so special and it and it's so memorable. And when you say you you used to think that it was he would had copped out as a writer, yeah. and now you love it so much. What is it that right. you feel like you discovered? I think I think I discovered what I think the solution is is coming up with your own language, and it might look a little lazy. It might be like this person didn't study up hard enough, or uh, they're not giving the music of that region its due. But um, I. It's a it's a tricky thing to do. But I would imagine I'm going to be presumptuous here and say I would imagine that when you're pitching this musical to people, it's already a difficult sell. It's already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's already. If you said if you said and the music is way out there, it would. But when you but when people hear how accessible the score is, mm. there's there's something that allows you to participate in it. It invites you in. I think. I mean, I, I've now heard one song, you. but you know, oh, Charlie, what do you but have to add good. to this? Yeah. I don't mean for Tim to monopolize. No, the no, yeah, he's, I'm he's doing, doing so doing well. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I and I and I think that 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 was sort of our hope that like what initially struck us about the subject matter was was not was was partially that the practice existed and that it uh, it was it was uh, of course shocking to us in many ways, but but I, I think. Um, the real thing that, that made us eventually come back to it and go, okay, we have to write this show, is is the questions that it that it sort of made us ask about our society and ourselves and and sort of questions of of morality, like the idea that all, all of these men are 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 are, ver are religious fundamentalists. They're all um, uh, very and that and that's sort of what the show puts in stark relief is that that they. It comp you, people compartmentalize and and you know I mean like it's it sounds silly to compare it to fundamentalism in this country where we choose you know people are very uh, we choose what to be ideological about like we choose uh, this you know last year it was gay rights who, who or, or 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 the morality of, of, of you know two two men being together uh, next year it'll be something else um, and uh, I think um, at the at the same time. It's like no one's actually a biblical literalist, right? Like, you know, we've we've all had these discussions. If you read the Bible, like, we're not sacrificing sheep. Yeah, we're not sacrificing sheep. We're not stoning people. Even people who I very strongly disagree with aren't aren't aren't, aren't doing those things. So, so this sort of brought up a lot of questions of like these 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 very religious, very fundamentalist guys came up with these amazing justifications as to why the Quran endorses uh, Bachabazi, which it doesn't. It's very clear, like, to most people who are sort of scholars and study the Quran. But um, but if you, and, and also it's related to these men are the ones who have the power, so they sort of get to say what the Quran says and what the Quran doesn't say. And, and, and it, it felt very similar to the political discussion in this country in, in some way. So I, I think that's all to say that that for us it was very important to translate the material and make it not a show where you go and you go, oh, isn't that so terrible? Like, what, what happens over there? 
Like, right. thank God we live, you know, like, yes. and we didn't want that because that's not, uh, we were introduced to the, to the practice uh, through a frontline documentary. Um, and it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a really great documentary. And, and that doesn't leave, with, leave you with the impression of like, oh, this is like some weird, isolated, foreign thing. It leaves you with the impression of like, wow, humanity is kind of strange sometimes. And like, we, you know, um, the way that we create rules for ourselves and organize ourselves is, is, is very interesting. And exploring that at the margin says something. Mm-hmm. So when, when Tim first started talking about coming up with a score that definitely, I mean, you did your research, you know, like you listened to a bunch of, and, and the, the, the band setup actually, I mean, it's one thing on a piano, the band is a mix of uh, Afghan instruments and, uh, and Western instruments. What are some of the Afghan instruments? Well, uh, the national instrument of Afghanistan is the robab, and uh, uh, lutes are actually really big. So, in general, and, and are there robab is... players at local eight hundred two? There actually <laughs> are. There actually are. There are. Of course, there are. Yeah, so we found one. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, and and it's it's kind of an exciting sound too because the lute slash guitar is a very contemporary sound, mm-hmm. like. When you hear something being plucked, I think it takes your ear to, um, or can take your ear to a contemporary place. And a pop sound. That's been yeah. so fun to experiment with because mm-hmm. we can try to uh, uh, overlap Western sounds with, you know, with, on these these instruments. Um, I bet you learned a lot when you made your demos. Just having is that when you oh, yeah. hired new musicians and. Yeah, actually, uh, we did. Um, I I thought I was going to be forced to do everything on a keyboard because uh, another instrument called the dambra. I'm probably mispronouncing that word. One day I'll find out. Somebody will tweet it. Yeah, yeah, does anyone out there know? Um, <laughs> uh, tweet it. Tweet it. <laughs> tweet it. <laughs> Things are going, going very well. well. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, it's uh, it's a two string lute, and it's really cool sounding. And there are people playing pop tunes on like on YouTube. You mm-hmm. can look up. Dumbra and uh, in all of the various spellings that we have of that word, and uh, and you know, and it's it it's a really cool sound. Usually, the lower string is uh, is a um, a drone, and then the other string they play the tune on. So it's very particular sounding. I really wanted to use that sound uh, in this show, and I thought it would be impossible on guitar, but it turns out it is not impossible. <laughs> so away with the keyboard and in with the guitar players, right. and then we found we um, uh, found a guy who actually plays the rabab, and uh, and I'm hoping more and more and more we can work in uh, actual actual Middle Eastern instruments, and we have a percussionist who is going to play both Western and um, uh, Middle Eastern percussion uh, and piano. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's the, those are the sounds we're, we're dealing with. Great. Um, I forget what question I was answering. Was that, that was about, I mean, we got off on the, yeah, yeah, about the creating the world of the music and about the right. instruments and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. I want to hear the next song, please. Okay. Let's do it. So, oh. Since so much of the musical would obviously be about dance, um, how did the did, did you investigate the vocabulary of dance and, and how that influenced your your? Yeah, I'm your going to repeat the question. I'm just going to repeat the question because I have a microphone on for the people who are watching. And he was asking about since there's obviously so much dance, did you research the dance and the movement and how does that influence what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the the piece was written. Um, you know, obviously I have a very I've, I've watched uh, videos of the dancing um, I have a very rudimentary knowledge of dance so the way it's the way it's written I did it, it sort of leave space for a choreographer to come in and we had a very sort of fortunate opportunity recently uh, where a, a small theater company actually did a, a dance workshop with us where they they brought in this amazing choreographer who we had been following for a while we, we sort of random we were on the lookout for choreographers with, um, we sort of wanted it to be similar to the score in that uh, it, it would just feel of a piece with everything else, uh, so so its own sort of voice. Um, so we were looking at modern dance choreographers, but also choreographers who did have some familiarity with, um, with at least uh, dance in the Middle East. Uh, so we went to see this 
show called uh, Oasis, Everything You Wanted to Know About the Middle East But Were Afraid to Dance. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and it was Nejla Yatkin's yeah. uh, choreography. And, and she was, I mean, she was, it was just, a, we were like totally blown away by it for the yeah. entire piece. And then smack in the middle of the show, there was a dancing boy routine. And it was one of the coolest pieces that either, it, it was, yeah, it was really I, I should probably just say what, because it was just so cool. It was basically this, this boy um, who, um, uh, this man comes in and just puts these bells on, on the boy's hands, which are, which are uh, you know, sort of traditional to the Bachabazi dancing. And uh, at first, and it's like the boy alone on stage, and at first he's, he's sort of like jerking around trying to get the bells off of his hands. And then over the course of the dance piece, he becomes more and more comfortable with them. And what used to be him of trying to get these bells off becomes him learning how to use the bells. And, 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 it, and it, sort of, it sort of grew into a, into a translation of a Bachabazi routine. Because the thing is actually the routines, which they're meant to be sexual in Afghanistan, but to a Western eye, like if you watch them, you wouldn't necessarily pick up on that because I think sexuality is a very different thing in Afghanistan. So there, there was some, once again, some necessary translation that Nejla needed to do to to use some of the vocabulary that we identify as as uh, uh, um, as provocative dancing. Um, but um, by the end of it, it was he was so comfortable in his own skin, and he had become you basically saw the entire evolution of a dancing boy in like three or four minutes. And, uh, and, and I think by the time that piece ended, we were like, I don't, and we made this, this theater company fly her. She was choreographing in Chicago and we were like, no, like it needs to be her. Like you need to buy her plane ticket, like I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but she was very kind and, and responded to the material, which was very lucky and, and so it was. And that was New York Theater Barn. Oh yes, that. yes. And they're amazing and we're grateful to Yeah, them. we're very happy with them. Shout out. Awesome. All right, guys, come on up. Okay, so this is at the end of Act One. Um, so Payman, you know, if you remember, had his sort of his entire life, uh, you know, the only life he, he's ever known was taken away from him, and he was told uh, by his master that he's to be married off. Um, and uh, shortly after that, he meets Feta, and Feta is a... Uh, a, a dancing boy who's who's new to to the the area. Uh, one of Payman's master's friends actually just bought him, um, and Feta is much brasher than Payman, um, and uh, the two of them sort of form a friendship that uh, borders on something neither of which neither of them really know what that is. Uh, um, and what's happened right before this song is uh, Payman's master who sort of views Feta as lower than than Payman because he's not going to be married off. He's he's f from a very different background. Uh, Payman's master doesn't want Payman hanging out with Feta um, and Payman's master beats him pretty severely uh, for hanging out with Feta. Um, and then Feta comes and finds Payman and uh, the song begins. Wait, introduce Jamin. Oh, sorry. This is, uh, this is Jamin Nantha Kumar, right? Yes. Nantha? Okay, awesome. Uh, who's also amazing and fabulous, and we're so happy that he's singing. He's horrible. He's like everyone. When you're a famous musician, and when I have a wife, we'll forget about this. We'll have dancing boys of our own, and we'll be the same. No, not us. I don't care how old I get. When I have a boy of my own, I won't scare him or beat him or treat him unfair. From the day that I find him, I'll hold him and remind him how deeply I care. I'll be there when I I 
Oh, sorry, Bachabazi. I should, I, I should slow down. It's so basically, it is, um, uh, it's, it's literally translated to mean boy play, um, and it is just the practice of men, wealthy men, old owning younger boys, and they, and they, they, they get them a, a music and dance instructor when they're they, they buy these boys essentially away from their family and their poor families that are that really need the money. So. Um, they sort of sell their children, and uh, the, the boys are given lessons from a very young age, and they're then sort of a status symbol, almost sort of, they, they, there are echoes of, of, of this in other cult cultures, geishas is, is, is an example, um, and uh, they're paraded around at these parties, which tend to happen after weddings, or sometimes happen after weddings, where the men sort of retire to uh, an after party, I guess, is, is sort of the best way to describe it. And, uh, and the boys sort of come out and they, they dance, and, uh, um, the, and, and it's sort of like these men showing off their boys. But, but very often the men sexually abuse the boys is, is basically the, uh, the darker underside to, the, to that culture is, is I think. Um, it's actually an ancient age. tradition. Yeah, so it's it's been around for a really long time. So it's one of those those things that there's there's I mean the dance is beautiful. There's like a lot of art and a lot of poetry that's been inspired by it. Um, and it's also not it's not obviously across the culture. It's it's a it's, it's practiced by a small, yeah. Yeah, small group. Um, of people. So it uh, uh, and and actually well one of the one of the sort of stories about the rise of the Taliban, which is, is not 100% proven, but they, they, you know, the Taliban really, because there was like, you know, a, a ban on, on music and dance in general, uh, the ta Taliban in particular officially went after Bachabazi, and, and, and there is uh, a sort of story that, that a lot, that some of the power uh, that uh, the Taliban got was, was that they sort of promised to keep uh, these these boys safe, these families' boys safe, and uh, and so that was sort of doesn't have much to do with, with our show, but that's a, a, a small sort of side story. Um, so how? So I have a lot of questions. Yeah. I'm going to take over awesome. for a minute. Um, I 
when, the more you talk about it, it's, I mean, I'm responding to Tim saying at the beginning that he was resistant to writing a, a show about this, but he found his way in through the score. And and as you've presented it, I absolutely see the musicality in it, the dance, sort of how it is theatrical. I see all of that. I imagine that it is a hard sell, which yeah. I said before, and that when you, even as you're describing it to people, I can feel you being like sheepishly, and then it's also about this. Yeah. Like, it's tricky. It's tricky. So how are you, how are you finding your way, finding the people who who want to see it, the people who want to program it, the people who are, are brave enough to deal with what is really scary subject matter. And yeah. especially when you say the Taliban and Afghani and you know right. and people immediately react in all of our all of our own personal fears and histories and what we hear on the news and you know. So we all have very distant context for it that is probably a lot of misinformation. So how are you dealing with finding your way to the people who can help you yeah, I, I think it's I think it's a couple of things, and, and we can take, I mean, first of all, it is just about having allies <laughs> like who read the piece and really like the piece. Uh, uh, we we were in this. Uh, there's this lovely festival called NAMPT where they um, they present 45 minutes of your show in front. Of, they have uh, a bunch of member theaters who all fly. It's uh, the National Alliance of Musical Theater. Yes. It goes by NAMT. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's a new work. They or it, they're a big organization. They do a lot of wonderful things. One thing that they do is that they uh, they have a festival every year of new works, and um, they have a very diverse group of theaters that come to see NAMT. So it's always I, I do you know I really appreciate the risk they took on this show because there are huge theaters that are. Two or three thousand seats that are never going to program the boy who danced on air, and and so that 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 was a discussion. But I, I think the good thing about having a show like this is I, I will say I did we did we were hesitant at the beginning, and it was exactly that. It's like it was so theatrical. The the, the material spoke to us in so many ways, and yet there's like we're going to end up with this show, and really is anyone going to? want to touch it with with a 10-foot pole and ultimately our goal is to have people see what we do um, so uh, but the the funny thing about it is I think it works both ways a little bit I think there are people who um, have a particular desire to see musical theater tackle big ideas or or new terror I mean like you know I, this series is a perfect example uh, we were lucky enough to get programmed in a night called Behind Closed Doors because um, it's on its territory. And I think that I think that there are it's the the good thing is that there have been people who, you know, we definitely needed to do our research and and we you know were helped out by 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 certain people in in that. But but once you get past that step, I think. You immediately have people's attention when you go. Oh yeah, I wrote this musical about Bachabazi, um, and you know we've written other shows or uh, you know uh, another show or two that 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 d that wasn't off the bat. I feel like off the bat people have a strong reaction one way or another to this show, which which is a which is it can be a good thing. I think, yeah, you know I think people make themselves known when they're really interested in a strange topic mm -hmm. like that. That's been our experience. I mean. I think that also helps us decide how hard to push the pro and how much money to put into the demos mm -hmm. and like how how far to follow it through is when people are interested we're like oh great <laughs> whatever you want right right <laughs> yeah yeah so. can we do the last song yeah. yes absolutely so this is actually I think the the most the new the most recent song that we wrote for this show um, and uh, this is so basically the dynamic that you've been watching in Act One is that uh, Payman, who uh, Giuseppe is playing, is sort of the, the slightly younger, the, the more sheltered, relatively sheltered uh, of the two uh, compared to Feta. Um, and then part of what you're watching actually is, it's a, it's a growing up story for Payman. He, he sort of learns to stand on his own two feet. Um, and so this happens in act two and uh, what's, What's, what's happened is, after Boy of My Own, the song that you just saw, uh, uh, Payman and Feta start planning on running away together. They, they're, um, they uh, want to run away to Shad Sharan, which is a nearby city, um, and uh, they have this idea that they'll be able to get lost in the crowds there, which is, which is naive, but, but um, uh, 
they, Jahandar, Payment's master, finds out and actually uh, shoots Payment in the foot, um, which sort of is a, a, a huge blow to Payment who dances his refuge. Um, and uh, so at this moment, uh, Feta comes to see Payment, sees that his foot has been injured, and basically is ready to call the whole plan off. And this is the moment where, where Payment sort of has to get into the driver's seat and say, no, this, we, we absolutely should continue with our plan to run away. Um, so, uh, Giuseppe and Jamin. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm good. Okay, awesome. I know you're nervous, but now it's time to follow through. Payment, your foot. I did that to you. You think a busted foot's the worst of it? I got hurt and I got burned, but those are scars that I have earned. And next to what I've learned, those wounds are small. You don't know what you have done at all. You entered my world with defiance and a plan. I would say that's when my life began Guess in a way you started to set me free That's what you did to me You left like you danced and the steps were all your choice Others had hurt you still, you kept your voice along in their relationship is Payman was worried about the upcoming wedding that he was going to have to go through, so Feta walks him through the ceremony. And uh, in, in modern Afghan or current Afghan weddings, uh, uh, a drop of henna is placed on, uh, on the palms of both the, the bride and groom. Uh, traditionally, or hundreds, you know, years and years ago, uh, that was, uh, you, would, you would cut your palms. So the, the whole reference to touch your hand, we did, they, the, the boys cut their palms as sort of a symbolic wedding. Um, and uh, so that's, that was that reference. I should have said that before. Yeah, well done. Yeah, Perfect time. No, you know what? I got it. I mean, I didn't know, right? We got it. Yeah, they, they're nodding. They got it. Les, Leslie has a question. Um, not a question, but just want to say, I, I really applaud you for taking on this musical. And I find it so interesting that you talked about Richard Rogers and um, the King and I, because Roger and Hammerstein were the first people to take subject matter that was very difficult and turn it into a very accessible musical theater. And so I think over and over and over, yeah, again. over and yeah. over again. And we think of those shows now as things that 
now that there are elements that we just think, oh, what's the big deal? But back then they were. And so I think it's extraordinary that you're taking it on. And the three songs you played to me are so universal. Like, I'm starting to tear up talking about it because oh, it makes so me much. want to see the piece because so you did take the subject matter away and made it very universal on how human beings um, help other human beings. So it's extraordinary. Thank you. That's incredible. Thank you. I would say that um, it strikes me that a goal a goal might be for your audience to feel they're just like me and then realize how different they are but that that's you know isn't that what we all try to do in musical theater is to like cre present a story and that has nothing to do with our audience and have them relate to it and feel like you've tapped into something universal right it's a, and I mean that's the awesome thing about like <laughs> having the tool of having someone say like no one else has that that like I, I, I it's very rare that I, I hear a character saying and I don't connect with them because mm -hmm. like music does mm -hmm. that so it's so it's easy <laughs> <laughs> congratulations yeah, you guys thank you We have one more team to present tonight. Come on up. This is uh, Stephanie Salzman, and her partner, Deborah Brevoort, is not here tonight. No, she's in Mexico, poor thing. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> um, hard but I'm, so I'm going to do my best to represent the uh, book, writing, book writer side of the project. Fantastic. So, hi. Um, hi. So uh, introduce yourself and the piece, as we've been doing, and tell me, and let's pretend your imaginary yes. friend is here. She and um, she's always there. As far as I'm <laughs> how did you guys meet? How do you work? What's your? How did your collaboration work? What made you take on this piece? All of those questions. All those questions. Okay. Deb and I. Uh, I was in the writing and the uh, reporting world for for quite a while, and I had written theater before that, but I hadn't taken it to quite uh, that level. Decided. My career went into the recording world, and then I really missed the theater. So I was meaning pop my, music recording. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was writing pop and R and B. Uh, and uh, so I came back with a project in mind, and that took a while for me to kind of evolve it and uh, search around. And ultimately, I was introduced to a lot of writers, and uh, ultimately, Deborah through the NYU Musical Theater Program, where we <coughs> both went, and she's actually me teaching too. there uh, now. Uh, many of uh, us. There are many, many of us. us. <laughs> All of us. Yes. And uh, we hit it off, and. We talked about the project, and interestingly enough, uh, during the meeting, she mentioned that she was researching, she's always researching something Amish culture. And my project was involved with pop stuff and melding my two worlds in a personal way, but also dealing with a young uh, a female protagonist, um, a young teenager growing up in America. And suddenly when she said Amish, I was like, wow. What about, <laughs> and we just went from there. And uh, there was some kind of flyer on my table about an itinerant hip hop minister, and Deb picked it up. And I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden it became an Amish hip hop musical. And an Amish <laughs> hip hop musical, it's and your subtitle. <laughs> it probably it is. is. <laughs> it is exactly what it is. And it's very funny because it's dealing with some of the same themes that I was interested originally in doing with the other project, which is not doesn't exist anymore, but it, it really has satisfied my, my needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've evolved from there. We weren't always in the same place at the same time over the years. Long story, that's too boring for here. But So there was a slow start, um, but, but steady. And uh, we're on fast track now. Um, we uh, did, trying to think of the evolution, uh, we are, we're probably in like a two and a half, th third draft at this point. Uh, we got invited out to Nebraska, which seemed like the most unlikely place in the world to go. And Elisa now it seems like it's all over the place. Is it Elisa Bellflower? Elisa Bellflower. I mean, you guys. It was the ASCAP Musical Theater Workshop who had said to them, oh, you guys should do something there, and they did. And boy, did they ever. They came, Michael Kirker was like, whoa. Uh, they put University it of Nebraska, Elisa Bellflower is the head of the musical theater program there in Lincoln. And she's brought me out to do my musical. Yes. She's brought you out. Anyone yep. else here been to Nebraska to develop their musical? The lead center is connected with the UNL. And there happened to be also two, there's a trifecta of powerful women there. Elisa is one of them, and the other two are Petra uh, Valquist and uh, Rebecca Boson, who ended up directing our piece. It was supposed to be Elisa, a complicated story. But three pieces were invited out there. We did 25 and 50 minutes. Um, we had already done some rewrites. Um, and then we did more write, rewrites. Deborah always says we're on a first draft when we're really on a second because she's already rewriting <laughs> while we're, you know what I mean, before, ahead of the curve. So we went out there. We did the, uh, those short sections. And they basically called us after and said, what can we do for you? 
That's great. And we said, bring us back out. We want to do exactly, it was like a residency. We were staying in a home, and it was like a residency along with a, it was perfect. And we said two more weeks, and we would have had the next draft. So they said, well, come on out. And that's where we're going on March 5th. Um, we're heading out there and we're going to do the whole piece. So, and we have the same cast with a few exceptions um, and uh, people, mostly writer, uh, characters that we needed to redo. Uh, unbelievable, you know, the people out there, you get out there and we walk in and there's this like, playlist of Midwest and I'm like, whoa. And then I'm like, well, this is perfect because we know what New York urban is. So what we didn't, what we needed to do was put in the other half of the piece, mm -hmm. Amish hip hop, <laughs> the Amish part. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually do have an Amish community, not quite around that place. So that's what we did. We did a crazy uh, kind of way of writing the piece. We wrote, De Deborah says we, we did the songs first. It's not exactly true. We had book, more book than she will let on. Um, but we decided to go into the studio and write a lot of stuff in the studio because a lot of the, uh, the piece takes place in New York and has what I wanted it to be an authentic sound, not just piano translated into, but done in the studio. So there is very uh, traditional musical theater songs infused also with the, the uh, at, alongside uh, the more hip hop pop tracks, some combination of the two. And then there is the Amish sound. Um, <laughs> the Amish sound being very, very traditionally would be what I equated to Thomas Gregorian chant. It's sung one line, everybody sings together. Singing alone is Hakmet, proud, and that's part of the theme of our main character who obviously wants to sing and she doesn't want to sing with everybody else. Um, and, uh, but then I also went to kind of the more Mennonite hymns, and so I wanted to open it up. We didn't want to be boxed into stuff too intensely, mm -hmm. but so we have that. Um, How many of you are dying to hear what this <laughs> sounds like? <laughs> <laughs> right, totally. Can you, let's start with something, okay. present the first piece, yeah. and then we'll have a context sure. for it, and we can keep talking. This is the very opening, so I thought that would be a good way to start, um, and it kind of speaks for itself in terms of setting up the world. Um, so we are playing, uh, Partially because that's the way the piece is presented. We're playing. I'm playing tracks, and we'll do one live song with actually maybe just a snippet of another live song uh, to tell you something after. But this is the opening. But as you said, a lot of it was built in the studio, and so the yes. tracks are the accompaniment. That, yes, that they're very and they're skeletal right now. But but what I decided to do was create them in a way that I knew I could build them later. Mm -hmm. So they're not like just oh this sound substitute garage band. I mean we're really hopefully having tracks that we can build later. There will be some live instrument too, but it will be done to try. And will it ultimately be something that you can rehearse with a piano in a rehearsal yes. room, or you would always rehearse with tracks? We, we need to mostly do tracks if we can, but we do, you can rehearse with piano, yes. We do mm -hmm. rehearse with piano. We're doing tracks and piano, only piano. Uh, out in Nebraska. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you can do it with, with piano. It just depends on, for the reading itself, mm -hmm. uh, we really need to But in the same tracks. way that Tim was talking about the Afghani instruments, you know, like we didn't hear them tonight, but we, you know, it's part of the, it's part of your it's part conceit of, the whole, of the whole show. And Michael Kirker made this first exception ever, and we were able to use the tracks in, in, in Nebraska, because he knew, he, when he looked at it, he realized that we really had to do it. Yeah. So the only thing you should know about the opening is called Galassenheit, and Galassenheit is the philosophy of the Amish people, and it means, there's another song called Give Up, Give In, but it, it, that implies that, and you give yourself over to, to God and to the community, and there's no self, there's no ego. It's uh, just all for God, you're only on your way to the next life. This is just a transition until heaven. Great. So Galas and Haiti. <laughs>
God, the earth will yield its gift. Earth submits to the plow. Amish to the vow. Darkness turns to light. Yield given, living gallows and high. to grow Make it will burst from its shell like the ring from a bell trust in God the earth will yield its gift earth submits to the cloud. look the sky cloud passing by Amish to the cloud. I'd like to know where it's gonna go darkness turns to I can hear the cloud sighs it glides to the sky it glides through the sky Rumspringer begins. In two hours, we'll be free. What are you going to do for Rumspringer, Rebecca? I don't know. I haven't given it much thought. Gretchen! Rebecca! Yes, Mama? Finish up. It's time to go to church. Meet us behind the barn after service. You've got like two hours to decide what you're going to do. Opening number. That's, that's the first thing we hear, number. right? So I love. She described that when the the beat, the hip hop music starts coming in, that's a car passing by. That that's that's where the source of that sound that she responds to. But I, what I my first impression is, I love that in the in, you know the traditional rules of musical theater that at the end of the opening number, you're supposed to know who you're supposed to pay attention to and what the conflict is and like what the world of the show is. And I feel like you did all of that in that number. Like we we understand the two worlds. We have a sense of the conflict that's imminent. We know who we're paying attention to. So that's all very successfully done. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, what else? What do you have to say about it or what? Um, well, they, we, um, they talk about Rumspringer. That this has been in the news a lot, actually. And it wasn't when we first started writing this piece. That's, but uh, we didn't really concentrate on the Rumspringer. We were going to do that, and we shipped it. Did you explain what that is? Do we know what it is? Uh, Rumspringer is when uh, the teenagers, when Amish teenagers are allowed to go into the Devil's Playground. We do have a song called The Devil's Playground. It's a great title. Um, and uh, they can do whatever they want. And when I say whatever, I mean whatever. And they do. They drink, they have sex, they do whatever. And the idea is that uh, when and if they come back, and they don't have to, but when they're ready, they come back and they take the vow. And that can never be broken. 
if they take the vow and they break it, they are shunned, and they can't ever go home. So there are a lot of stakes. Um, but we decided to only concentrate on Rebecca with that rather than the other teenagers. But that is a backstory. There, she has a sister named Gretchen, and the other teen teenagers are, are around there. So. Um, and do you have to define that just in the same way we were talking about Wiccan, and like is that? And, and, you know, in all the pieces today, there, there are vocabulary things that, that the audience won't know. Do you define that, what that period, Rome Spring, and what that is in yeah, the course of the show? I or mean, do you assume that the audience knows it? No, we're going to have to define mm -hmm. it. And we had more information on it than we do now in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so we might need to put in a little more. We do have some dialogue in there that says, what are you going to do for it? Right. Um, but we don't have that issue in terms of the stakes at this point, but we do have it. In but as it comes further yes. in, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not arguing that you yeah. need to have it all in the opening number, but you yeah. know, so no, that absolutely yeah. we have to have it. Mm -hmm. No question about it. Mm -hmm. that, and yeah. I, I imagine, especially on the, the theme tonight, that that becomes a question of uh, if you're if you're introducing people to worlds that they don't know, there are going to be elements of that world that you then have to explain. It becomes more um, uh, exposition necessary than maybe in a you know. Definitely. But a I show think about 20 somethings in New York or rock and roll music or you know things that we all have a little more context that for. We, yeah, exactly. But I think one of the things that we're interested in is delving into that world as it reflects the modern world, the rest of our world that we know very well. And that's one of the things that we're integrating in the show and the values and the idea of family and community. So we're very interested in those layers and are working on those layers in the show. Mm -hmm. um, they're coming pretty naturally as we explore the characters. Um, and where are you in the process? Like uh, we have a, we now have a. Um, you mean in terms of the drafts? Yeah. Yeah, we're um, we have it through, drafted through to the end. Yeah. Uh, we're right now working on we're reworking end of first act, and we have just really finished the end of the second act. So our intention in Nebraska is to really see what we haven't seen, which is the last two thirds of the second act and uh, see whether the new material is, is, is working there. We saw the first 25 minutes as very solid. We were happy about that. I'm sure there'll be more changes. But, and then after that, we kind of patched. There were things we had to patch together, but we knew already what we were going to rewrite and for certain things and then with other things that we, we did too. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, that's where we're at. I think most of the meat of the work we're going to end up doing is going to be that uh, second part of Act 2 or the two-thirds uh, two of it, and hearing material we haven't heard before because right. there's new songs, Yeah. Um, you know, since then. So and right oh. after that, um, the Reverend and his girlfriend, Blue Jay, make their entrance, and he's the other main character. Uh, so it's the Reverend is the itinerant hip-hop minister and Rebecca, who are the main characters, and then we have Blue Jay, um, who's his girlfriend at the time, who's looking for the nice life. And then um, we have also Milton, who is her Amish boyfriend. So there is a pull there of a few different, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a triangle. And your next piece is Performed at the Piano, right? Yes. Um, this is uh, Rebecca's song. Uh, after we meet the uh, minister and we hear he, he performs a song called Lost, uh, because they literally, their car breaks down and they get lost. That's the car we've really seen in the beginning. So it uh, does... Uh, solidify mm -hmm. and uh, we see he and uh, Blue Jay talking about how they're lost but it has another meaning lost in terms of what the two of them are intending so we can already see there's conflict or that the two of them are going in different directions um, and then after that we go back to um, seeing Milton and Rebecca and they've planted the salary which means they gotta get married but she doesn't want to go through that um, and she's trying to explain to Milton uh, why um, something's bothering her and she might not be able to do that. So uh, this is the song I'm going to bring up, Juliet Carbonier, and where's Willem to play so I don't have to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you love to play too. Right? I, <laughs> Any chance I get? <laughs> um, this is Willem, who's Tyson, who's a wonderful composer in his own right, and Juliet, I'm sorry about the touches. Um, she just came from doing um, something at the French Institute of Performance of the Bar and Zombie Prom at Hunter. So we're talking about an intense week. Um, <laughs> yeah. Performing, um, this is called In the Mirror. So she's singing this to Milton, uh, the Amish boyfriend.
are really interested in doing, you know, the clothes, and this is what they do when they're in rum spring. Oh, I want the clothes, I want to do this. And so she's set apart a little bit, and they're trying to get her to put on the makeup, uh, her sister is, and she does finally look in the mirror, and that's when she sings this song. So she's not really interested in what they're interested in, but there's something else that she's looking for. That's great. I mean, so many of the great musicals, I think, are about a character who's not like everyone else, right? It's just right. such a great way in for you and the audience to be like, that's me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Whatever, what, right. however you identify, you're not like everybody else. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. which yeah. is the way, the universality that we're all looking for that we've been talking about yeah. over and over again tonight. That's great. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump right into your next song sure. because it's a track, and I'm, I'm really interested in how the track and the live music yep. mix and yes. sort of the how you're making that all work. That's very Absolutely. interesting. Um, the next song, by the way, and I should mention, I think I already did, that Dabra does the book, and I do the music, and similar to some of the other teams tonight, we co-write lyrics together, which is a fabulous thing. I love that. Makes it very interesting. And how does that, do you sit in the same room and bounce them off each other, or do you do a draft and email it and she responds to it? Or like, all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. It depends on where we are. I mean, you guys I, too? Um, I'm just going to open up. Do you guys share lyrics? Uh, Oh, you do lyrics no, alone. I, I don't share things. You don't share things. <laughs> <laughs> Selfish. And do you guys share lyrics? We do. We do share lyrics. And yeah. do you? Um, uh, it, var it varies. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There are. I, I think our most common is like I'll write a draft that's more prosy in order to get the story down, and then he'll take a pass. But we, yeah, we can sit in the same room and do it. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think as a uh, as a songwriter, uh, I often need lyrics. Right. I need to write the music along with the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So v there will be a, a lot of times when I'll come with that first, but and then she will come in and edit and everything. But there are also times where she leaves and she knows not to do it exactly, but she writes some half versified thing and then I can pick out of it and then we'll go back and edit together. So, mm -hmm. you know, it works all ways, so. So the answer, everyone who is like, is music lyrics first, everyone always asks that question, it's, it's different for everybody, it's different for every team, and it's really different with every song. And every day, and every yeah. song, yeah. exactly. So this song is, uh, what happens is that um, this, bro the broken down car with the irreverent and Blue Jay, um, so as you might imagine, they show up and there's a wonderful moment of them all looking at each other, the Amish, you know, the hip hop minister and all that stuff. Um, and they're looking <laughs> to get to the mall, which is where they're preaching. They're doing, um, they do what's called hymn hops at the mall. So they've gotten lost, they need to find the mall, and they've come across Rebecca and, every, and she hears, suddenly there's this idea of music as a celebration rather than as sort of a more kind of sobering uh, way to celebrate God and so on. Um, and uh, come on to the mall, they say. And so she decides to go. Of course, Milton's not very happy about that, but off she goes. And this is the hymn hop. And you hear Blue Jay testifying. So we get to hear her character. Well, we've actually heard her character in Lost her and the Reverend, but we get to hear a little more of her in this too. So this is the hymn hop. This is a dance number um, in the mall with the shopping carts. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Come to the hymn. Get it where you shop. 
hip-hop hop we gotta let the hymn hop fill you to the brim hop we got a message to impart so go get yourself a shopping cart give us an hour or a minute we got something to put in it you can save yourself for free guaranteed there's an open line of credit come on come on and get it god is waiting at the mall it's time to heed the call you want the holy grail salvation is on sale at the hymn hop my life being good doing everything i should spending sunday in church doing the spiritual search but no matter how hard i tried i couldn't find god if i died those sundays were a chore and church was such a bore so i said no more and i went to the mall i'm going shopping i said to the preacher give myself a lift if jesus can't raise me up then a new pair of shoes will I'll get three inches off the ground and a little closer to heaven. So I headed to Payless, and there sitting on a shelf was a pair of blue high heels, the color of sky. Aerosol size seven. And let me tell you, that was heaven. And I put those shoes on and I felt good the way you should. And I said, that's God. in your shoes, he's in the heels, walking tall is how God feels, you don't gotta go to church, cause God ain't always there, God is all around you, God is everywhere, he's on that rack, Him up. he's down that aisle, Him up. he's in this dress, Him God up. got style, uh-huh. is he in those earrings, uh-huh, he's in the dangle, is he in those bracelets, uh-huh, When they jangle, he's in everything you like, he's in everything you wear, he's a zip in your zipper, he's the highlights in your hair, he's in your camera, he's in the flash. She'll make the headlines, she'll make a splash. Oh, world of music in the street, people singing loud without a care. Shopper, just a born again hymn hopper going on a singing spree and doing what comes natural to me. I'm gonna talk straight to God without a preacher in between. Gonna kick the Amish or dunk squads, give up, give in routine. I don't have any choice, I've been denying for too long. Cause I found God in my voice, gotta praise Him with my song. I'm gonna walk the street called straight. Gonna sing the hymn called hip Cause praising the Lord feels great In a singing fellowship I'm gonna walk the street called straight I'm gonna sing the hymn called hip Cause praising the Lord feels great In a singing fellowship I'm gonna walk the street called straight
Perfect. I was hoping it would end on one, and it did. I was like, please don't put a button on it. <laughs> Perfect. Really we good. Are, um, we did a little rewrite in there, actually. So Rebecca's going to be much more like, oh my god, this feels great, and it's going to be more in that kind of realm. So by the end of the song, she's sold mm -hmm. on, on this on the reverend and his mission and all that. So, um, meanwhile, she's been noticed by the press. So that's the important information in there. There was a, cam a camera guy going, oh my God, look at this Amish girl doing this stuff. So that's the story starting to roll into what happens into act two when they go to New York. Great. With a record producer and all that. And wow. <laughs> you guys have questions? Are there any questions here? Yes, I love you. Yes, go ahead. It's great. Hi, you know, at the beginning um, with the um, the Jella Sennheim, Jella Sennheim. Said, that you were doing the consistency of the um just as the Eastern you know spirituality people were doing you like the, the chant the chant going, yeah the chant led the whole thing as an introduction yeah which I find very interesting because it comes from a whole other world yeah well, it, as I said, it sort of reminded me of, I just love them always being in the background, and that's another way, the joy of recording, you know, so we can kind of keep that all through the first scene. Um, and then that song gets transformed into Hip Hop Velocinite later, but um, we do go back to it later at the end of the piece, just that one, that one note, um, which I love, yeah. yeah. Which is unity, which is, yeah. you know, so yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's all, obviously, there's no harmony stuff. And it's that idea that it's universal, that like at our core we all are own. You know, yeah. We all are. <laughs> yeah. One note. Yeah, we all are. Um, we're at time, okay. but I want, but do you want to do this last number? How, how's that for an introduction? <laughs> no pressure. I, I know you were on the fence about it, but do you want, I, I'm Actually, okay for you to I, do it if you want to do think, it. Um, no, what I think we should do is just play saved. On okay. The, yeah, because um, we're at time, so I have to choose one or the other, and I think we're not going to do the whole song. Okay. Um, Gretchen has a song that we were just working on writing, and we haven't, we're, we're under rehearsed all the time. But, um, but what, the reason I want to play this other song instead is because it's actually the sketch for what will be the end of the second act. Um, so it's called Saved. And um, the reason also I'm going to play is because in your mind, I mentioned a song called Lost earlier and that will work in um, about the characters by the end of the show who are saved and the characters who are lost um, and it has to do with their choices um, and in terms of their community and there is one thing I should mention the last thing which is kind of interesting is that there's a lot in common between the world of the gang world and the Amish world which are also community and uh, the Reverend is looking for a community so those things kind of to come together. Which I would say all three of the pieces have tapped into that idea of community and about finding your like, your, you know, your soulmates, your like people, or the people who are like you, the people you have something in common with. Yes, yes, it's such a Such an idea of our time, I think. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So you're hearing on this, uh, uh, Rebecca and the Reverend, um, but it's going to be the end of this toward the, the end of the second act. It's the beginning of the finale, the finale sequence. And I think the other thing to remember is who it's saved, but it's also it's a love song and it's about the people, but it's also a love song to the music. Great. I could kiss those bent notes, those exactly what I meant notes, those have and to hold, cause they're pure and heaven sent notes. The music I'm singing makes everything real. One word describes how I feel. Save, saved by you, nothing less than. Simple and true, I am saved, saved by a song. This music is a blessing that makes me feel strong. I have found my lost notes, those keep my fingers crossed notes. Those daring to do it, no matter what the cost notes. The song we've discovered cannot be denied. This music has changed us inside. Saved, saved by you. Nothing less than a miracle. Simple and true. I am saved, saved by a song. This music is a that makes us feel strong. This 
Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. <laughs> I led to this place where I know I can Actually, because you heard the loss theme in there, which I'm starting to work in, so I haven't kind of figured out all the parts yet. But everybody's in there, mom and dad, and you know, so it does feel like finale, like everything coming together in counterpoint, and you can hear that that's in process. You can hear yeah, that and it is, in, it is mm -hmm. very much in process. We were actually thinking of it in the first act, and that's where we did it in the reading, and we're like, this is this is the second, this is the end of the piece. Mm -hmm. It's like the love song to music, and it's it should should be the end, so I, I have a lot of reworking to do, you know, but. But that's exciting, and you have, now you, I, I think, when you know that you're doing it for Nebraska, like you're doing it for, yeah. I, I always yes. say that, you know, when you, when you know you have a reading coming up, it's not even, it's not even about the reading, it's about knowing that on a certain date you have to put a score in the hand of an actor, mm -hmm. and that's what makes you finish it. Everything up I'm like, the then I don't care, just part. rehearse and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, everything, yeah. I mean those rehearsals and those rewriting for me are just the, the lifeblood. Yeah. I mean, the, the reading itself, I know the actors are going toward that and they're, you know, whatever. But for me, that's the it's dessert. About the that's process. like, yeah. It's the whatever dessert. Whatever happens, happens. And I, you know. Yeah. And they're great before. I mean, we're able to throw a lot at them. Mm -hmm. So, as you, in, you know, mm -hmm. if you've been there, I mean, they're really some great people there. And you can, you can do that out there. So, anyone who is in a, in, uh, has the option to give writers a chance to hear their work, whether a university or a theater company or something, it's just the most valuable thing for writers. If you can say, hey, I've got some actors and a piano, and if you want to hear your piece out loud, I can do that for you. It's just yeah. the greatest gift for people who are in development, because we, yep. we so often hear pieces in our head, and you know we read them with our collaborators, and we're like, I think this will be funny. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and I think they're going to, they're, you know, I don't think it's going to stop there. I mean, we're talking about other things past that. so. Um, I think it's going to be a question of where we're at too and where we're ready, you know, when we're ready yeah. and where we'll be at that point. But it, that is absolutely true and, and we know exactly who we're, yeah. who we're writing with and for. And uh, we were able to deal with, and we have new characters we're dealing with. There's a record producer um, character who's uh, been someone we're exploring. We're deepening the Reverend, um, there's the gang members um, that we're working on too. And uh, Deborah, I wish you were here. She's, Phenomenal. She's a fantastic structuralist, and as a as a co-writer, I am so lucky to have someone who's a great structuralist, and uh, as well as a great a writer and lyricist. So, um, you know. Well, yeah, applause to Deborah and to you. To Deborah. And I want to thank all the performers and the pianists who are here tonight. Everyone who. Yeah. And thanks to our writers, and especially for you guys for bringing us together for this yes, great thank occasion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you to Georgia. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you for coming.